morning, everybody. Uh, we're pitching Discover Financial Services today. Um, we think it's a buy. So, just a little bit of company overview. Uh, you might know them as a credit card company, but they are more diversified than that. Um, payments are their principal source of revenue. Uh, they are Discover cards. Uh, they have credit cards. They have Diners Club International, which is a licensing uh, credit card that uh, they use internationally, and Pulse Network is an ATM uh, debit card. Uh, function and then they have a fully online banking system now. So um, they have checking, savings, CDs, money markets, and IRAs. Um, and the online banking reduces the overhead costs. They don't have to have, uh, they actually don't have any physical branches. Um, and then they offer loans, so personal, student, and home equity loans um, that they're growing. So 81% of their interest revenue, which is uh, their, the main part of their income, uh, comes from revolving credit card balances. So that's their primary source of business. So our investment thesis, um, we think that uh, it's a buy. They have a diversified uh, product mix and aggressive growth strategy, um, and a few strategic advantages, uh, including uh, the implementation of innovative technology um, and flexibility in capital holding requirements, uh, as they are under the $250 billion uh, threshold of assets to be considered a systematically important uh, financial institution. Got it this time. Um, they are uh, they have a beta of 1.22, so they're um, a little bit uh, more, uh, I would say, risky than the overall financial market. Um, let's see. Market cap 23 billion, uh, it's significantly smaller than uh, Visa and Mastercard, which are the two uh, primary credit card companies, uh, but it's similar to a few other companies, which we'll talk about later. So for valuation, uh, we have a target price of 7853 uh, It's pretty much right in line with uh, most investments that I've seen on other analyst websites. If anything, it's a little bit conservative. Uh, every uh, other analyst that I have seen had it as a buy. Morningstar has it as about 81 and then uh, the highest uh, recommendation that I saw was 91 So uh, we are a little bit under other analysts. Uh, we used uh, relative valuation with the highest percentage uh, for a weight of 45%. As far as business strategy and outlook goes, um, they target middle to low income U.S. consumers, uh, which is different than some of their competitors, including American Express and Capital One, which are uh, generally targeted to higher income consumers. Uh, one benefit of this is that lower and middle income consumers generally have more revolving credit card balances, which is their most profitable source of revenue. Um, and they also target uh, students and younger people, so uh, it can be an advantage uh, in the future uh, getting, getting younger people onto their uh, business products or uh, uh, They're trying to grow loan growth through, through um, expanded wallet share. And what I think they mean by that is they can offer basically a one-stop shop for a consumer's financial services. So they want people to have their credit card and then also operate with them through banking and lending. They're also trying to up their international acceptance rate. Right now they're the third most accepted internationally behind Visa and MasterCard, uh, where they're trying to expand uh, and get accepted in more places. And they're also uh, implementing an aggressive marketing strategy through um, email, direct mail, um, social media and uh, really targeting younger people. And then they also have lots of innovative implementation of technology that we really like. So uh, they were the recipient of a, an award in 2019, the Digital Edge 50 Award for leveraging uh, artificial intelligence to assist customers in making payments. Uh, and so basically they uh, can analyze when a customer might need help uh, and can't make a payment and they offer like payment plans for them things of that nature to avoid uh, consumers <coughs> defaulting on their loans or their credit cards. And then they also just, about two days ago, I think it was, uh, announced a partnership with Zest Automated Machine Learning. Um, so this is an AI platform that uh, analyzes uh, tons of different aspects of a consumer's uh, financial stability, basically outside of the credit score. And uh, it's shown in the past uh, an ability to, to um, it's shown the past an ability to weed out uh, poor credit consumers and uh, reduce loan losses. And then just a quick overview of the management and corporate governance. They recently, recently had a CEO change um, in October 2018, but it was a very smooth transition. He's been with the company for 20 years. 
uh, as the president and CEO of Over 14, so um, there was no disruption there or anything like that. Uh, with that, I'll pass it off to Caitlin to talk a little bit about the financials and the competition. Yeah, so some of the um, major competitors, in addition to Visa and MasterCard, is Synchrony Financial, American Express, and Capital One. Um, they're all banks and also credit card companies that issue credit cards and um, do some loans and everything like that. Um, the three we, we chose the three um, these three competitors because they had similar market cap. Um, Discover's market cap, as mentioned earlier, was 23.4 billion, and then the other three are um, around the 20s, and then with American Express being um, 90 billion as well. Um, the EPS uh, is basically right in the middle of the um, of the competitors, and then. Um, so it's a three-year EPS growth, and then the the NIM is the net interest metric. It, see, it sees how the how much of the interest they get back on the loan or something. And then so um, we can see just in general with all of the um, metrics and everything, the Discover is does quite well according or in with its competitors. And then the financial metrics that we use um, to look at this is the revenue and then the return on assets and then the earnings per share and then PE ratio and then um, the return on equity and the price to book and then the tier one capital which just says how much of the capital, how much of the assets are risky compared to all the other assets. It's one used for banks a lot. Um, and we could see between 2000, 2017 and 2018, the value of the majority of those financial metrics has, it has increased substantially. Um, the only ones that really decreased is the PE and the PB, and that's because the earnings um, for the company have increased, which is a good thing for us and brings more substance, I guess, in the company and value. And some of the catalysts that go into um, the stock price to make it grow higher is that right now it's going through a period of um, striving for global expansion and increased acceptance rate. Um, currently, it's Discover's products are um, accepted in 185 countries and territories, and they're third only to and then they're third in the world behind Discover and MasterCard for the um, for the like merchants that accept their cards and their products. And then also the organic growth of online banking and personal loan segments, especially in addition to the fact that most of the people are young, middle income people, and this is a large generation that's coming to age right now. And then also it's looking for the consistent revenue and EPS growth in the um, time to come. <coughs> and then some of the risks that go with this company, because it is financial company, they're all going to be mostly financial risks. The first one is a credit risk, which is just the potential that a borrower um, will fail to perform the obligation and pay back the debt that they took, um, especially that they're middle income and poor people, this um, risk is something worth to note. And then there's always going to be a market risk um, with the interest rates and geopolitical um, issues that might make things, or might have an adverse effect on um, the, the company. Then liquidity risk because um, finan because Discover is also paying back some paying back the loans and giving the money um, is a risk that there might not be enough money to pay back their obligations as well. And then just um, with the, some risks with the strategy as well. Um, 
as they fight their competitors and as they um, see if their marketing and their accounts are going to work out um, and have the desired outcome. So one thing on the, on the growth strategy, um, if you notice on their financial statements, their expenses are growing at a very fast rate as well as the revenue. Um, and part of the reason that, that that's happening is because they're really competing with rewards. Um, it's a pretty competitive environment to offer cashback rewards and things of that nature. Uh, and so that costs a lot, but they're doing that right now to grow the customer base. And I think in, in the next few years, that will uh, have a return on investment um, to be able to reduce these costs. This, yeah, Discover really um, started about 10 years ago, like right after the right after, right before the crash of 2008 is when they became public. So they've really spent the past 10 years um, creating their customer base and creating their products and really trying to solidify their place in um, the financial market. So, well, are you, are you guys? Um, how does their business model differ from Visa or MasterCard? So I think they're uh, a lot more diversified than Visa and MasterCard. Uh, Visa and MasterCard don't have personal banking and savings accounts, and I don't think they offer student loans or anything like that either. Um, so they're much more in the payment and technology services. Yeah, so then how does the, the business model of Discover then vary from, say, Capital One? Because it doesn't have the same business model as either of those two groups. Yeah, so Capital One, if you go on our website um, and you look at the credit cards, they're all for excellent credit ratings. Um, and so they're arguing to a much different target audience than Discover and is trying to get. But it's a pretty similar business model in general. So there is something that Discover does that's different than what Capital One does, in that Capital One is just a credit card issuer, whereas Visa or MasterCard are credit card networks, and Discover is both a network and an issuer. Um, so this is something that maybe is not widely understood because all of you probably have some card in your wallet that says Visa on it, and so you assume it's a Visa credit card. That means that's the network. Um, so like when you swipe that card, it goes and pings some Visa technology, and that all happens through Visa. They don't take on any of the actual risk that if you don't pay off your credit card bill, it doesn't bother Visa. They earn a transaction fee from you swiping that card. Where uh, Capital One is a credit card issuer, so they take on the credit risk, and they maybe contract with Visa, so Visa does the payment processing, but they take on the actual risk, and they earn like a net interest margin on having customers who maintain balances, etc., on their credit card. Uh, but Discover does both. Is there anything that you might like about that business model, or like? Why, what's the advantage of a network? What's the advantage of a credit card issuer? What's the advantage of being both? Are there some sort of synergies to being both? I think just um, having a more diversified kind of base and being able to um, control more things mm -hmm. is always a good idea for the market stability and market, just to have your place in the market, because um, you have your place in the market for the issuer and then for the, um, the merchant, for the other one. Uh, there's the one that you, you use, network. the network, yeah, yeah, the issuer and then the network, and then you're just um, more stable and more able to um, be independent of other people and, um, and other companies and other things. I think one, maybe one of the benefits is they do have a debit card um, in processing network, and they're able to uh, leverage that to make these off that as well. Um, so you guys mentioned they operate in 185 markets worldwide. Uh, is that just as an issuer or also as a network? Because that's actually a big debate right now, and I've heard it discussed a lot for like Visa and MasterCard. I'm not sure how Discover is being treated in this, but China de uh, is allowing foreign payment processors into the market for the first time. Um, and but there's well, technically they're allowing them in, but they're not really. Uh, they put up a bunch of roadblocks, making it quite difficult for Visa or MasterCard to actually access the market and have market share. So are they functioning there as a payment um, network as well would be probably a big question just because it's such a big market. I'd probably want to know that. Yeah. Um, you guys talk, I think, oh, so go ahead. Oh, I think also an advantage is because it's not, Visa and MasterCard is not one of the big ones. It is kind of smaller fish and then there's, less 
less attention paid to it, so it might be able to uh, fall into some of the cracks. Well, that, that could. I'd probably want to see, just double check, check and verify that they're actually able to operate as a network there and not just as a credit card issuer. Sure. Yeah, part of the international that they have are not, I think like their Diners Club International where they license that to different credit card companies. Um, so I don't think they operate as a network everywhere. Yeah, I think I think that primarily they're a network in the U.S. Uh, even yeah. though they do operate in other countries, it is only a fraction of what they do. It's primarily in the U.S. that they operate all of their activities. Then talk to me a little bit more about their growth strategy. So you talk about like growing their share of wallets. So when a company says something like that, what it means is they want to take their existing company com customer base and have those people have more of their products, right? Um, so I'd probably look at that and want to see metrics around um, like how many Discover products does the average consumer use? How has that grown? Yeah. Um, so I'd want to see that. I'd also just want to see like overall, like so it sounds like that's one part of their growth strategy, but they're also maybe trying to reach new consumers as well. Yeah. So what's their year-over-year -year growth rate for customers? Um, yeah, we, that's, those are great questions. We should get those hard numbers yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, a little bit anecdotally, so I use Discover actually mm -hmm. in my personal life, and I know they send tons of marketing stuff. So they, they send me student loan, um, direct mail, and uh, savings accounts, and they offer rewards for existing customers. So that's part of the way that they're trying to expand that organic growth. Okay. Um, so I would actually just want to see some like hard numbers yeah. to see like how they're actually doing on that. Um, and then you guys ta talked a little bit about them targeting either middle income or low to middle income. We use both phrases at different times. Um, since they are a credit card issuer and they have a bunch of like loan products, um, are, do you have any concerns about them taking on that credit risk? Are there any metrics you want, want to explore further there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we did look at their, um, what's it called? About the non-performing loans ratio. It was about 1.17%, um, which was pretty much in line with other, um, we should have put that in here, um, but it was pretty much in line with other companies. Okay. Uh, and so I think that is a concern, but they're doing a good job of using technology to try to um, make sure that they're still. Yeah, and I think their other, their other products might be I think they're diversified enough, like their loan component um, might not be as large an issue. Um, if they're offering credit products though, that's basically a short term loan, so it's the same right. it's the same setup, like yeah. uh, are people paying off their credit cards, uh, are people able to pay the fees, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the other risk I'd probably put up there that I don't see up there, um, that I'd, I'd say this is maybe an outside risk at this point, but something you should, should be aware of, and probably add, add this is just regulatory risk, because um, credit card fees and um, like consumer credit is kind of a popular topic that comes up every few years for debate, um, uh, whether it's increasing disclosure requirements or there is during the financial crisis, creating a whole new regulator, and they keep on changing the role of that regulator, so the consumer financial protection. So it's something to think about. Um, do you guys have a, a slide with the stock performance? Because it's hard to see the chart from your handout. Oh, um, we don't have yeah, a slide for that. I apologize. It was easier to see in color. Um, over the past five years, it's actually underperformed the S&P 500, but I think in the past year, <coughs> it's been positive. I would just want to maybe look at an overlay of the two, or like look at it against the financial sector and see if there were any times where it moved um, out of lockstep with the overall financial sector, and then just look at the reasons behind that, um, whether it was they missed earnings or some other announcement, or why, like what drives the volatility. Okay. Questions from the class? Um, uh, yeah, so you kind of mentioned it before, but um, that their interest income is increasing, that their interest expense is increasing at a faster rate due to your, the aggressive growth. When do you think that they're going to either stop this aggressive growth, or when do you think that those are kind of flip to where interest um, income is higher growth than interest expense? Um, like at what point within the next... I would hope within the next three to five years, probably. Um, 
it's going to depend on how, how well they can grow the customer base. So that's where the risk is at, is if they don't succeed in uh, attracting those other customers. That's a risk, but um, I would hope that it would be in the next few years, for sure. Um, you said that they want to publish the They um, were actually funded in, or founded in 85 as a subsidiary of Sears. Um, so they were Sears' like financial bank kind of center. Um, do they have anything to do with Sears now? No. Okay. Yeah, they're still headquartered in Illinois. That's good. Do you want to? Yeah. What? Percentage of the revenues come from banking loans and payment services. You know, did they say that? In their time time? Yeah, I think it's um, about twenty percent. It's not that much. Yeah. Um, interest expenses by far there. Oh, or in interest income. Sorry. Um, so, I mean, if you look at your actual comparable companies um, over the last three years on EPS growth. Uh, Discover is the only one that's actually positive. Yeah. Um, none of the like they have all been kind of negative. Yeah. Can you? Kind of, do you have like a reason why like all of them they're all negative, but Discover is actually kind of positive? Um, yeah, I'm not. I can't speak to the other companies that much. Um, Discover it's partly they bought back some shares as well, um, and then earnings growth. Um, the other companies, I'm not sure why they're trying negative. Yeah, we should have done this. Yeah. <clears throat> Questions? Well, I have one last question. Since you have Discover products, what what made you choose Discover? Um, well, when I was a student, uh, a friend had it, and they offered like a fifty dollar reward to him if he like signed something up, and so and like I got like a twenty five dollar reward or something. And then also, it's easy to get it, get it as a student when you don't have a lot of credit history. So I was like eighteen or nineteen. Um, and then also, they offer pretty high savings rates. On the Um, the one comp I probably want to see you guys add, um, have you guys heard of Ally Financial? So it's an online only, it used to be the financial arm, it seems to be a trend here, it's spinning off financial arms, it used to be the financial arm of, I want to say General Motors. It's A-L-L-Y. A-L-L-Y. Yeah. Um, so they do like high interest rate online savings yeah. and a, a several other products. So I don't think they compete um, with all the credit products. Um, but I'd be interested to just compare them, like in terms of their strategies. It might be another interesting one to look at. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you guys.